So all these people came here thinking they were going to hear from Jay Leno, and first they have to sit through this. So. Okay, we're we're running a total scam. Yeah. And I just am I echoing? Um, I just have to say briefly how far up I've come in two weeks. Two weeks ago, I was at President Bush 41's library to do an event for the Presidential Scholars. It was going to be my first book event. I was very nervous, and a bat got in the room. Is there anybody here from A&M? Yeah. Yeah, we're at Kyle Field in a dining room, and a bat got in the room. It was a dinner event. I hate to be blunt, but I think the 43rd president would want me to. The bat pooped all over our dinner. <laughs> and, it's and, the whole, and the whole event was canceled. And now I'm opening for Jay Leno. I feel good. <laughs> well, we're honored you're here. Uh, you're, you're a uh, chief of staff mentor to me. You were President George H.W. Bush's chief of staff for how 25 long? years. 25 years. And um, after Mike Meese hired me to come to Dallas to work for George W. Bush, the first thing I did was go to Houston and figure out how to run a, a, a former president's office. And so I'm grateful to you for your example. Um, this book has Barbara Bush's name on it. Yes, and it does. You started working on it after she passed away. And I just wondered, did you take ghostwriting too literally? <laughs> Uh, you know, I guess I sort of ran a scam on Barbara Bush. I published a book with her name on it after she died. <laughs> uh, but there's a reason her name is on this book. And when you buy your copy, and when you buy a copy for your grandmother and your mother and your Uber driver and your neighbor, and you read the book, you will see that it's her voice that's in this book. It's not, I'm the narrator. I'm the one who put the puzzle together. It's her voice that you will hear in your heart and your soul and, yes, your conscience. And it's her voice you're going to hear right now. We're going to bring her into the room right now and get some pearls. Great. One night, I absolutely couldn't sleep and found myself thinking, about what I've learned in life, sometimes the hard way. Try to find the good in people and not the bad. Isn't it better to make a friend than an enemy? Do not buy what you cannot afford. Don't try to live up to your neighbors and be sure you pay people back. Value your friends and remember that loyalty is a two-way street. Love your children. Don't worry that your children never listen to you. Worry that they're always watching you. Those human connections with spouses, with children, with friends are the most important investment you will ever make. So you really shouldn't take yourself or life too seriously. Someone once said there are two kinds of people in the world. There are those that wake up in the morning and say, good morning, Lord. And there are others who wake up and say, good Lord, it's morning. <laughs> make sure you're the former and not the latter. President Bush always talks about a pearl that, uh, that adorned her doorstep. It's, it was a doormat that said, birds fly high uh, because they take themselves lightly. And I think that summed her up in a lot of, of ways. What do you think she would have said when she saw a book with her name on it purporting to give her advice to others? I keep waiting for her to smite me from above. But so far, so far she has it. You know, uh, she would protest that the book is too much about her, <laughs> and it is about her. But we need her voice right now, and so I hope she would approve that I did this book. And I'm actually going to read just a little section here. She had excuses. She knew she was bossy. She knew she gave out a lot of advice. So this is what she used to tell students in particular about why she was so bossy. Now, I can't give you any advice on how to be a good teacher, or a writer, or a scientist, or an actor, or dancer. I especially can't give you advice on dancing. But at this point in my life, I can share with you some of the ideas on how to survive the inevitable ups and downs. 
After all, in 80 years of living, I have survived six children, um, 17 grandchildren, six wars, a book by Kitty Kelly, two presidents, two governors, he's in here a lot, big election day wins and big election day losses, and 61 years of marriage to a husband who keeps jumping out of perfectly good airplanes. <laughs> So it's just possible that along the way, I've learned a thing or two. So the very first line in this book, the 43rd president was very gracious to write the prologue. And his very first line is, some would say that mother was bossy. That maybe was a little understatement. And one of my favorite stories, it is not in this book. I'm saving it for the second book, which I'm writing. Be afraid, be very afraid. My, my favorite- tell all. It's a tell-all. Yeah. My, favorite, my favorite story, one of my favorite stories is uh, the 43rd president was in Maine to visit his parents for the first time after becoming president of the United States. And I think he went out for a run. And the Bush family had this weird habit. They all gathered in the 41's bedroom in the morning. <laughs> the, the president and Mrs. Bush, uh, the 41's would be, it's very confusing here. We'll say the 41's would be in bed in their pajamas and the whole family would pile in. Well, the President of the United States comes in and plops down and puts his feet on the coffee table, to which his mother said, I think I have this right, George, take your feet off my coffee table. And I think his father said, Barr, for heaven's sakes, he's the President of the United States. <laughs> to which I think Mrs. Bush said, I don't care. And I think the feet came off the coffee table. Yes, they did. <laughs> What's harder, talking about her knowing she's watching down on you or that her son is in the front row staring at you? Thanks a lot, Freddie. <laughs> I'm a little nervous anyway tonight because of the 43rd president sitting there. This is the first time I've done an event in front of him. And now you're talking, and now I'm nervous. It's, uh, we'll just ignore them both. <laughs> well, Mrs. Bush is here too, Mrs. Laura Bush. And she was a recipient, I don't know whether it was solicited or not, but a recipient of advice from, from Barbara Bush. Um, some of it she says she was grateful because she, she learned how to be a first lady watching Barbara Bush. But I think she wrote a funny story in here. Uh, Laura Bush has one of my favorite stories in the book. I had asked all of the in-laws for stories, and she very kindly sent me one. And some of you maybe have heard this story, but you can never hear it too often. Um, her husband, George W. Bush, was running for office the first time, and I think for Congress. And your mother-in-law advised you, don't be too critical of his speeches, don't be too critical of his public appearances, because apparently BPB had tried to give her husband some advice that didn't go over well. But one night coming home late, um, you felt compelled to gently tell your husband, honey, I think there's some things about your speech maybe that can be better, and he drove into the garage wall. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's one of my favorite stories in the book. Uh, but back to you, you're talking, leading by example, Mrs. Bush was, gave us a lot of advice. And it was, she was usually right, quite frankly, which sort of made me mad. But, uh, you know, I probably learned more, all of us learned more from watching her. And one of my favorite stories, when she was first lady of the United States, she woke up one morning and read in the Washington Post, that the Washington DC malls were closing the malls to the Salvation Army Red Kettle bell ringers. They thought they were disruptive, the shoppers didn't want to be bothered, and so they kicked them out. There was one mall in DC, Mazda Gallery, that was gonna let them ring the bell. So the First Lady of the United States called her press office and said, get the press, go to Mazda Gallery, find a Red Kettle, and meet me there in two hours. So it, it was my job to organize that, and we're waiting at the red kettle in the mall, and the press is like, what's gonna happen? I'm like, I have no idea. I, the first lady's coming. So in she comes and puts, this is odd, $11 into the kettle. <laughs> I confess I wanted to say, you don't have a 20, <laughs> but, uh, but you know what, it didn't, it didn't matter. She made that donation and that was it. 
the malls backed off. They let the red kettle back in. And when she died, literally the Salvation Army, I shouldn't use the word literally here, the Salvation Army uh, put out a statement saying she maybe single-handedly saved the campaign nationwide because they were fearful other malls around the country would follow suit. But she put an end to it. She led by example. And 11 bucks. And 11 bucks. Um, and I could tell 10 more stories like that, but they're waiting for Jay Leno. But I do just want to say, I just do want to shout out to another first lady here named Mrs. Bush. You led by example, too. And one of the things that I think all of us remember is what you did after 9-11. You, your husband was out, you know, saving the world, but you were making us feel safe. You made the school kids feel safe. You were amazing then. So I just have a chance to thank you publicly, so I'm going to do it. You also led by example. Uh, Barbara Bush followed her own advice on the speech criticisms. I, the only emails I ever received from her were at prior to 5 a.m. <laughs> and they were in response to speeches that I'd send out that President Bush had given. And all they would ever say is, I'm so proud of him, or what a great speech. And that was, she's known as a, you know, sharp-tongued, tough woman, but she was, she could be very She liked too. you. Well, yeah, she liked she you. She didn't know me. <laughs> what I was her... <laughs> I was her speechwriter post White House, and uh, I don't know what I was thinking, but I put into one of her speeches, I had read this really funny thing that Betty Ford had written about her sex life with her husband, and I put it in Mrs. Bush's speech, and she called me at 6 a.m. and said, Gene Becker, this is the dumbest, <laughs> worst thing I have ever read. And you know, she was right. Yeah. <laughs> what, was I, what was I thinking? Yeah, Come I on. <laughs> What was it like to be edited by her? This president has many initiatives here at the Bush Institute, you know, working with vets and global health, but one of them is a crusade to stop the use of the term, the overuse of the term, literally amongst millennials. I know, millennials. I can't believe I said literally. And I, I, I caught myself immediately, but it was too late. I, I loved writing for Mrs. Bush. We were a good team. Um, she was a great writer as was 41, they were both good writers, and it's fun to write for people who are good writers, and I mean, it really was her voice in the speeches. The editing I hated is I could be in the middle of this heart-rendering conversation with her. Mrs. Bush, I need to tell you, I have bad news for you. I need to tell you something. And I would be pouring my heart out, and she would start correcting my grandma. <laughs> and, Jean, it's not who, it's whom. I'm like, Okay, now back to my best friend who's dying. Yeah. And, um, okay, I made that up. But it could be something really serious. Or, it, you know, God forbid I would end a sentence with a preposition. And, she, and, and again, I would say, could you just listen to what I'm trying to tell you? Well, then say it correctly. That was, <laughs> that was the editing I didn't take very well. Well, what was the most important thing you learned from she? show off. <laughs> uh, you know, I think the most important thing, uh, I'm going to get a little personal here. Well, first of all, one of the most important things she taught all of us was to be yourself. Don't let others define you. You own who you are. So here's my true confession. I have no idea why I feel compelled to tell people this, but I feel very close to all of you now. Uh, <laughs> She did advise me over the years to lose weight, and she would say, Jean, and she'd be very kind and gentle about it. She said, Jean, for God's sakes, go on a diet. <laughs> so, in, in honor of her and this book tour, does anybody here watch The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel? So, I love that show. So about six months ago, I decided I'm taking this book tour as the marvelous Mrs. Maisel. I'm going to lose 100 pounds. I'm going to look cute. I'm going to wear bright colors. I'm going to be adorable. Well, there was one problem. I eat while I write. <laughs> I, if I, I could not write this book on cottage cheese. It just wasn't <laughs> happening for me. So 
I'm going to come back. There she is, Mrs. Maisel. See, wouldn't that be cute? So, but then I had an epiphany one day. Her voice is in my head. I'm editing the book, and she's talking about be, be who you are, own who you are, be comfortable in your own skin. And that's when I decided, I'm not doing this tour as her. I'm going to be the literary Lizzo. <laughs> And you know what? I'm okay with that. I mean, girlfriend, she's doing the Houston rodeo Friday night. I feel connected to her. <laughs> I had to ask for a photo. Of I Lizzo know you I need to. Not, you I didn't did know, know who, who I would, was. You need to get out. You're more. very hip. Yeah, I'm there. I'm hipper. You're than very hip. I thought I taught you everything. Um, so last week we opened up a special exhibit here. It's called Liberty and Laughter, uh, the lighter side of the White House. It has a pursuit of happiness walk where fair, uh, political figures get awards. And the quickest with the quip award went to Barbara Bush. It was for this instance. When the press noticed that, if, that she wore her three-strand pearl necklace everywhere, she explained that if she ever took it off, her head would fall off. <laughs> What were some of your favorite Barbara Bush? I'm just going to read a couple others. Is that how much time we have left? I'm going to read really fast. This is advice she gave when your grand teenage grandchildren come to visit. Be careful of criticizing their clothes. What they change into could be tighter and shorter than what you made them take <laughs> off. If you have a lot of tension and you get a headache, do what it says on the aspirin bottle. Take two aspirin and keep away from children. <laughs> And I'll just read one more. If you remain calm, you just don't have all the facts. <laughs> <laughs> There's one on the back I'll remember when I interact with my boss. Never ask someone over the age of 70 how they feel. How they feel. <laughs> um, well, to close out, you, um, I heard you say in an interview that you wanted this book to be kind of a safe place from talk of dark days and divisive politics and coronavirus. And so what can you share with us from this book to make us feel a little bit better? Uh, well, I hope this isn't too uh, bold, but I did ask my publisher, I think we should start marketing the book, the perfect thing to read in quarantine. <laughs> um, I, think, I think it will do well. Yeah. So uh, my publisher did advise me that I should end every event reading from the book. As a re he says it's a subtle way to remind people there's a book to be bought. Um, and I really gave a lot of thought what to read, and I had a lot of ideas. And then I had an aha moment, and I'm convinced it came from her. And what would she want to say to all of you if you were here? I'm just, this is 1991. She's First Lady of the United States. I'm just going to read a couple of, of sentences. She was really, there was something going on in this country that she didn't like and she didn't approve of. I've been trying to figure out what it is, but I'm not sure. But she talks about, I'm, I'm talking about the great need for better tolerance in our society. Real tolerance is an ideal our country has strived for since its beginning. To be different, that is what life in America is after all about. It can be difficult to be different in our society. Tolerance is much more than just respecting people of a different race. It's a constant stream of little acts in our daily lives, big and small choices we face every day on how we think about and talk about and treat other human beings. We should all be alarmed at the rise of intolerance in our land and the growing tendency to use intimidation rather than reason. Political, she wrote this 29 years ago. Political extremists roam the land, setting citizens against one another on the basis of their class or race. Such bullying is outrageous and not worthy of a great nation grounded in the values of tolerance and respect. Let us fight back against the boring politics of division and derision. We can do better. You can lead the way. I'm bringing her back. We need her voice. So if you could sum her advice up with one pearl, one final pearl. One final pearl, since I just gave you the what for on her behalf, 
she would want to end on a positive, positive note. The book ends with this in the epilogue from Dora Bush Cook. Mrs. Bush always said, you have two choices in life. You can be grumpy and unhappy and not like your life, or you can choose to like your life and be happy. Choose happy. So even though Jean's job ended, uh, when 41 left this earth, she uh, decided to donate all the proceeds of this book to Barbara Bush's lifelong uh, passion, the Barbara Bush Foundation for Family Literacy. So please, on your way out tonight, pick a copy up and support that great cause. Great cause. Thank you for mentioning that. Of course.